recently, I published a video about famous mega multiples like the Busby Quince, the Gosselin Sectuplets, and Octomom. Well, little did I know that your knowledge about famous higher order multiples runs deep. Y'all came storming into my comment section requesting, demanding that I discuss some other famous higher order multiples. So I am here to provide you with the requests you demanded of me. First family we're discussing is the Dilly Sextuplets, which is a famous set of sextuplets out of Indiana. They probably would have had their own TLC show had they been born of oh, 15 years later, but no, they happen to just hold the title of the first surviving set of sextuplets born in the United States. So Becky and Keith Dilly met while working at a Wendy's and they got married soon thereafter. They started trying to get pregnant and after about five years of trying to conceive, they decided to seek help from a fertility physician. That doctor ended up putting them on a medication called Perganol. This is a combination of FSH and LH, which if you've seen my menstrual cycle video, you'll know are hormones related to the first half of the menstrual cycle where follicle recruitment is happening. So that medication recruits more follicles, causing you to ovulate more than one time. They found out they were pregnant in November of 1992, and soon thereafter were told they were carrying five babies. However, if you remember back to just a second ago, this is the first surviving set of sex tuplets, which is six babies. They never knew about the sixth baby on ultrasound, and we've talked a little bit about this in the other video, but sometimes when you have that many body parts in there, it can just be hard to see everyone, particularly because in 1992, 1993, ultrasound was not even close to as good as it is today. But again, this could happen even today. I think less likely so, but certainly possible. They were born on May 25th, 1993, making them all now 30 years old. And I couldn't find exactly what gestational age they were at, but based on them finding out in November, being born in May and all weighing around two pounds, it seems like they probably were around 30, maybe 32 weeks gestation. Again, they only thought they were having five, so they were accompanied by five neonatal doctors and five warmers, and then in the shock of their lives, which <laughs> is saying something when you've already thought you were delivering five babies, they found out there was a sixth. They ended up naming the babies Brenna, Julian, Quinn, Claire, Ian, and Adrian, and they seem to like to live their life mostly out of the spotlight these days. If having higher order multiples was a contest in the 90s, the Dilly sextuplets were quickly outdone by the McAfee septuplets. Yes, that is seven babies. You have heard me correctly. Four girls and three boys. So the backstory to the McAfee septuplets is that Bobby and Kenny McAfee had their first daughter, Michaela, in January of 1996. And from what we could tell from an article in the Washington Post, they were diagnosed at some point thereafter with infertility. Now, my production manager, Karen, said it seemed odd to her that she went on to deliver septuplets in November 1997. That time frame to diagnose secondary infertility is a bit short. I would agree. I'm sure there is something more to that that we are not understanding, but it does seem like a bit of a short timeline. Regardless, she was given at some point in there a medication called Medtropin, which is a similar medication to what we discussed in the sex tuplets that we just talked about. She ended up getting pregnant after the first injection and had, as we just discussed, seven babies. Karen put a note in that said in one of the articles they called Kenneth, which probably is baby A based on this, the Hercules baby who was holding up all of the rest of the siblings. So it sounds like she was admitted for preterm labor and they were able to hold off on the babies coming way too early. She was in the hospital for seemingly one to two months before they were born. I think what they mean by that is that Kenneth was probably the baby that was closest to the cervix and maybe she was prematurely dilating and they are giving him credit for or keeping everybody up off the cervix to keep her from, you know, continuing into preterm labor. I would say it is more likely the medications, but who knows? You know, I, I, what do we know? The septuplets ended up being born around 30 weeks on November 19th of 1997, and their names are Kenneth, Alexis, Natalie, Kelsey, Nathan, Brandon, and Joel. There is some context to this story because they had a lot of attention on them, but also kind of prompted a conversation about ethics and responsibility in reproductive technology. There was a Time Magazine story from 1997 that said septuplets had existed before, but they had never lived past a few 
days or weeks. And President Clinton called to say, you know, when those kids all go off to school, you'll be the best organized manager in the US, to which Bobby responded that, or I will be in a straight jacket somewhere. However, the Washington Post did end up publishing an article with significantly more criticism and begging for discussion around the ethics of higher order multiples and reproductive technology. This is a conversation that has continued on even to this day. And things like this still happen, but was far more common in the 90s where we did a lot less monitoring of injections for ovulation induction. It's never really been, as we discussed in the first video on this, that in vitro fertilization is the cause of higher order multiples most of the time. Octomom was an exception. It's usually intrauterine insemination after ovulation induction or making a whole bunch of ovulation sites and then doing insemination via the cervix without having to fertilize the embryos outside of the uterus, if that makes sense. They have an interesting connection to the Dion quince, which all of you just raged at me for not talking about. Don't worry, they are in this video. They actually penned an open letter to this family begging them to keep their septuplets out of the public eye, which I find to be really interesting in light of how many families with higher order multiples that TLC put in the spotlight in the early 2000s. I think it's really interesting given that even way back when the Dion Quints were born, they recognized that that could be detrimental and it's even more interesting in light of the documentaries and news articles and interviews which have come out particularly with the Gosselin kids since I published that last video. Now we're moving on to the Derricos family and when I tell you this is the most interesting one on all of these lists, I am not kidding. Maybe except Octomom just because of the medical, legal, and ethical things that come into that one. But this family is famous for their multiple multiples, apparently all without the help of any kind of assisted reproductive technology. This family has twins, followed by two sets of triplets and a set of quints. Wow. <laughs> I don't even know what to say of that. So Meet the Derricos is a TLC show and it is about this family. They had 15 biological children resulting from six pregnancies. I don't know if it's a record, but it sounds like it should be. Dion and Karen are the parents in this family and they knew that they likely carried some kind of genetic predilection towards multiples and even higher order multiples because Karen's family had four sets of twins on her mother's side and two sets of triplets on her father's side, which is, you know, it would make me think I'm probably genetically predisposed as well. And interestingly, Dion says that when he met Karen, he knew that she was the one when he asked her how many children she wanted to have. And she said, however many that she would be blessed with. We'll just run through Karen's pregnancies now. So she's had six pregnancies. The first two, interestingly, were both just singletons and they were actually born five years apart, a girl and then a boy. That spacing is fascinating to me given the rest of her obstetric history and the fact that many of these articles implied they don't use any form of contraception. But regardless, she then got pregnant with twins and they were born in 2011. She had quints at 32 weeks in 2013 two boys and three girls. So at this point, she's got four boys and three girls from the multiples pregnancies and then one of each from the singleton pregnancies. I'm having to look at the list here because I can't keep up with all of it. She then had triplets who were born at 28 weeks in 2017. And sadly, one of them passed away shortly after birth. She had triplets who were born at 28 weeks in 2019. She has since had a miscarriage apparently in 2020 and again in 2021. But recently, I think earlier this this year told a magazine outlet that the baby factory is still open at 43 and she'll stick to her word of giving Dion as many babies as their God sees fit. Now we're moving on to Halima Sisse, a set of non-tuplets. You heard me right. <laughs> That is nine. I have nothing else to say other than it was a massive oversight that this wasn't included in the first video. And honestly, I'm just gonna blame Karen because she is the production manager and she runs the show <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Sorry, Karen. Anyway, this is really interesting because this was a fairly wide-reaching global phenomenon as far as hitting the news. And then there were a lot of conspiracy theories as to if it was even true. A lot of the pictures circulating on social media pictured neither her nor her babies. So there is some misinformation surrounding this. These babies appear to be the first surviving set of non-tuplets that we know about in the world. And they were born in May of 2021. There is no information out there as to if if fertility treatments were involved in the making of these babies, but I would presume that 
almost certainly they were. I can say that pretty confidently. And they ended up being born in Morocco after the Mali government had her taken there for health care prior to the birth of the babies. They actually originally thought that there were seven because again, it's hard to tell how many are in there when you start getting to these higher numbers, but she ended up delivering nine babies. They were apparently born at 30 weeks, which is shockingly impressive and spent about six to seven months in the neonatal ICU before all getting to go home. At birth, most of them weighed between one and two pounds. The only other non-tuplets that we know about is a set born in, I think, 1971 in Australia who all died very soon after birth, and another set which was in Malaysia in 1999 who also all died fairly soon after birth. Because there was so much misinformation circulating about it back in 2021, I wasn't wasn't sure what to believe. And I kind of just like let it go from my mind as, oh, maybe all of it was just not real. But it turns out it is real. And there are now confirmed information regarding this pregnancy. But again, nobody has confirmed whether or not fertility treatments were involved. I think it's probably fairly certain they were. But I'm just impressed they all lived and she carried them to 30 weeks. I cannot imagine. And finally, we get to the Dion Quince, which if you think that TLC exploits mega multiple families, <laughs> wait till you hear what the Canadian government did to the these kids. So this is the first known surviving set of quintuplets. They were born in 1934 in Canada, specifically in Ontario. I would take the details of this from a medical standpoint with a bit of a grain of salt because it was the 1930s, but apparently they were born about two months too early in their farmhouse in rural Canada and a doctor attended and the mother had preeclampsia. She seems to have been given an injection of a medication to help the uterus contract, which is probably something like oxytocin or there's many others and that helped her to expel the placenta, which reportedly was one placenta with five cords attached. That would mean that these are all identical quintuplets, which is incredibly rare. Unfortunately, after that, they experienced a lot of exploitation and abuse, there's one article that claims that they were worth around $500 million at some point when they were a lot younger. A 1978 New York Times article said that they were globally as famous as Charlie Chaplin and Mickey Mouse, which, okay, but I've never heard of them. And I know a lot of you have, trust me. You don't have to remind me. I, I did recognize that you've heard of them and I haven't in the last video, but you know, most of us have heard of Charlie Chaplin and Mickey Mouse, I would assume. Regardless, a lot of you have heard of them, but almost immediately the Ontario government sadly convinced these parents to sign over custody of the kids to the Red Cross, which is just heartbreaking that this mother survived a quintuplet pregnancy in the 30s, delivered living babies, and then was coerced into signing over her custody. They raised the babies in a sealed off environment across the street from this farmhouse. And even the parents weren't allowed to see them much. It's just awful. I think it's, I just, it's so sad. Within months of the Red Cross taking over custody, the Ontario government actually stripped the custodial rights from the parents, like took custody of their identical quintuplets away from them. And the babies were raised by the doctor who attended the delivery as well as the nurses, which is just super odd to me. They made them essentially a tourist attraction in Canada called Quintland and people could come by and pay money and observe them. And I just, the whole thing is awful. I wonder if there also was some element of the types of twin research studies that we see in identical twins that went on unethically a long time ago, you know, in the same time frame, if there was some level of that going on, particularly because medical professionals were so involved in caring for and raising these babies. Regardless, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And so now you can see why the surviving Dion quintuplets, when the family we talked about earlier was born, penned an open letter to that family and asked for them to keep them out of the spotlight and just let them live their life as normal people, because that's something that sadly these girls never got to do. They did have siblings. They had a sibling named Leo who sadly had died at the age of one month, as well as Rose, Therese, Ernest, Daniel, and Pauline, who were ages two to seven at the time of the Quint's birth. And I would love to watch a whole documentary on just this family to know, you know, what ended up happening when they were adults. Did they get to reconnect with their parents or any of their siblings? Because the brief research I did into how they were treated by the Ontario Canadian government is just horrendous. Like, I just cannot imagine. Five poor babies turned into a Billion dollar commodity for the Canadian government. And I guess that's a way to end this, that this is a problem which has existed for as long as we have documentation of and continues, you know, through 
TLC in many ways, right up until modern times. Anyway, I don't know uh, how to end this. I'm spiraling a little bit. So don't exploit your mega multiples for financial gain and don't let governments or corporations do it either. If you'd like to subscribe, we would love to have you hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. If you'd like to join as a channel member, you get access to the full live stream archive with full length Twitch streams. You can join by hitting the join button down below. I'll see you next Monday. I'm actually trying to post twice a week now, so maybe I'll see you soon on Monday. No promises, but I'll do my best.